Good morning. I'll pray for you if you pray for me. It's been a, it's been a, I just can't get my brain together today. Um, we have a fellowship afterwards, so um, be looking forward to that. Um, we're going to sing the song in the garden this morning, and I just think of the time when Jesus spent time in the garden before he passed. I mean, he had a lot of communication with God, and all of it wasn't um, happy thought, happy thoughts and happy words. He was going um, to do something that was hard for him, and um, he asked God, please take this from me if I don't have to do it, but he did it. He had all of us on his mind. He had all of us on his, um, in, his in front of him, and so he died for us, and that's, that is something that we have um, hope for, that our future is with him in heaven. So in the garden, you can sit and relax while we sing it. I come to the garden In your bulletin, you'll see that we are still looking for volunteers to clean the church. Um, that way we can make sure that we have enough people to um, accommodate the uh, vacation schedules that are coming up. We have our women's ministry meeting tomorrow at 7 o'clock in the fellowship hall. We are still um, in the... we. We go on our own schedule. We don't necessarily follow the book schedule. So we are still at the beginning of the Elijah series, um, and it's been a great time to be able to focus on a lesser known um, or lesser studied about character of the Bible and be able to pull things from his story to apply to our own. So I really encourage you to come out if you have not yet. We have our Wednesday night Bible study at 7 as well. Um, the men had their breakfast yesterday, so the next one will be on the 28th, and we have, like at a convention, we have our fellowship luncheon today following service. Um, Brandon's story is a story that's being shared this week, um, so if you want to take the time to read over that to get to know him a little bit better other than just the Lake Children's father. You can get a little bit more details about him. Um, and also on the back table, um, there are two little flyers. We are um, wanting to help support a scout with his Eagle project, um, and his project is to install a flagpole here at the church. So um, he's going to be doing a rummage sale. If you are able to donate items for the rummage sale, um, no clothing, please, and the items must be in good shape. Um, you can drop them off here at the church on Friday, May 20th, between the time of 5.30 and 8.00. And then the actual sale will be happening the following day on the 21st between 9 and 3. So if you have stuff that you're wanting to get rid of, this is a good cause to support. So um, bring out your stuff. If you guys would stand with us, we would say our scripture, Psalms 95, verses 1 through 7. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God, and the great King above all gods. In his hands are the deep places of the earth, the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. 
So come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just take this time to rest in your presence, God, to um, completely put away the worries that we've brought in with us, Lord, and just be able to focus on you and give you the praise and worship that you are worthy of, Lord, because you do so much for us, whether we're paying attention to it or not, the small little details as simple as a parking spot, God, um, you are always working for us and working through us, Lord, so help us to be able to focus on you. I ask that we will be able to enjoy the fellowship following service and get to enjoy time spending getting to know each other better, Lord. I ask these things in your holy name.
I get an amen? Amen. it to anyone, you can express it to God. Thank you, Jesus. God of my need. 
I've come to worship. I've come to worship. You're
deserve the glory today. Father, we're all going through things that sometimes seem insurmountable, sometimes seem that there's no way out, but God, there is through you. And when we reach up to heaven and we send our problems up to you, God, that you reach down and you touch us and you walk through us with these things. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're not a God that is dead, but you're alive and you have all the power that is in the universe to conquer anything that we may face. We have the victory in your name. I speak the name of Jesus over everyone in this room. I speak the name over depression. I speak the name over healing in people's bodies. I speak the name over anger. I speak the name over finances. I speak the name over marriages and families. I speak the name over this place. Your name has all the power that we need. Your name has, is just all. It's everything. So, Father, we give you this day. I speak the name over the rest of the service, God. I thank you for Pastor Doug, and I ask, Lord, that you anoint his lips and that there is change in this place today, that the words that he has to give people, God, will change their hearts, change their minds, change their attitudes, and change their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Boy, it's good, good worship. Thank you, guys. We're going to let all the kids go. So instead of dismissing them a little bit at a time, it's crazy down there. I don't know who goes where, so just go. <laughs> it's a whole lot easier that way. Then I don't have to remember what order and who's teaching and who's doing what. <laughs> so, hey, amen. It's good, uh, good, good day to be in the house of the Lord this morning. A um, couple things uh, that are going on. Um, of course, we had the fellowship, which we talked about, but uh, um, this weekend with the, uh, with the yard sale, uh, George, remind me, and I'll have the girl switch that and put it on the marquee outside uh, so that we have that. Uh, it's an Eagle Scout project. And, you know, with Eagle Scouts, they have to do a community project and... Uh, uh, we've chosen to to do a flagpole here at the church and and uh, put that in the front. So we want to help them out with that. So um, bring that over and then come buy your stuff back. <laughs> Isn't that what we do, Steve? We'll drop it off, donate, and then go to the yard sale and say, "Boy, I like that." Didn't realize it was yours anyway. But uh, uh, so uh, just being a part of, of of taking care of that would just be really really great. Uh, a lot of good things going on around the church. We've gotten some cleanup done and some the new doors put in. And and uh, but we have we have a few things. So if you have some time, uh, we got a little bit of painting that needs done. We need to paint the trim and things around. And so if you have a little bit of time, uh, let us know and and come out and work a little bit. And and uh, also with the um, uh, church cleaning. Um, that's one of those things that is a necessary evil. This place doesn't clean itself up. So uh, if you have and can be on the calendar for that, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. I'd tell you to see Lauren, but she's not here today. So it's like, don't have all the little lake ankle biters running around just cause it. But um, Lauren's really good friend, uh, Abby, was uh, ordained on Thursday and they're doing a service for her today. I think it's in Dayton, Ohio. So um, Lauren is, uh, is, is actually speaking some at this. And uh, so she's a little on the nervous side this morning, but uh, uh, it's good for her to, to stretch her out. So this young lady has put a lot of work in, a lot of effort uh, to go through the ordination process uh, to do that. So that's where they're at today. So lots of people doing lots of things. 
Um, vacation's coming up. Uh, people are going to be traveling. So just be safe. Uh, be safe. Uh, pay attention. It's not so much you guys I'm worried about. It's all the other people out there that I'm, I'm concerned about. But um, so, and, and continue to be faithful. You know, you've been faithful in your giving and and man, we are we are so blessed to to see what God's done here financially to the church. Uh, while you're on vacation, while you're sitting on the beach, you go, "Hope oh, I need to pay my tithes." Great, we have PayPal. You just hop right on there and boop 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 done. So, um, you know, uh, thank you again for all that you do. And 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 I mean, we look around and we see, and it's just absolutely amazing. Uh, we're getting ready on Monday. Uh, we're ordering a portable baptistry. So we're going to be able to start doing uh, our own baptismal services and things like that here. So we won't have to rely on finding a swimming pool and all these other things. So uh, we'll order that on Monday, and it ought to be here in about a month or so. So I think we'll have a service scheduled hopefully sometime in July. Um, and the nice thing about that portable is I can do it in the fellowship hall, or we can roll it out to the field, and we can do it outside. So it's it's really nice and, and good to have. So. Um, Amen. Uh, Let's go over this morning over into, uh, hmm, see where I want to start. I know where it's at. I'm just not sure I want to start there. We'll go ahead. All right. First Chronicles chapter 16. You know, we've been, we've been teaching on, and we've been talking a lot about prayer and we've been talking about the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Um, we've been talking about how to pray when we don't know how to pray, you know, and, and having the spirit of God within you to pray through you. Uh, you know, there's a lot of situations I walk into in my life. I don't have a clue how to pray because I, I I'm good at, uh, uh, at kind of messing things up sometimes. And sometimes if I pray what I feel, you know, what would you do if God took you seriously? We know that person cuts you off in traffic. Think about it for a minute. What would you just say? What would you do if God, we have a lot of lightning bolts coming from heaven striking people dead. You know, sometimes I don't know exactly how to pray in the situation I'm in. But that's why the Holy Spirit within me can make that intercession and do that. The effective fervent prayer we talked about is you can't quit. You can't quit. It's got to burn in you like a fire. It's got to continue. When you don't see the results that you think you should be doing, what do you do? Pray, 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 pray some more. Keep it going. Don't stop. When do you stop? When the answer gets there. If the answer doesn't come, you keep praying. You keep working. You keep going. The problem that we've run into in society today is we are an instant gratification society. And we want that to fall over into the things of God. We want the things of God to be like pulling up at the drive through order it, and you expect it to be done by the time you get from the speaker to the window. You know, it's really bad when you ha- might have to wait 30 seconds for your, uh, for your mochi maca mocha mocha to hand it out the window. You know, if I have to wait for that thing, I mean, you only drove 20 feet, but we are so instant. We expect it to be done now, and we expect it to be done right in the way we asked for it. If it's not, oh my goodness, our head will spin around. And then we'll post it on, on social media and, and tell how bad the service was at this place. And that's what, and unfortunately, that has creeped into the church in the way we see the way God works in our life. We expect things to be instantaneous. We think that if I take this before God and I say, God, give me this, boom, it's done. And I'm going to step right into it. There are times that you have to go through something. There's times that you need to walk through the entire process. The things that are going to work for your good. So at those points, we cannot stop our prayer life. Prayer is the number one tool that you have in your life to fight the enemy. It's also one of the least used tools that we have in our bag. We pray about things, but we don't necessarily pray for things. We've not learned to speak things into existence. 
We've not learned to use prayer the way prayer should be used. Prayer is, <clears throat> excuse me, a two-way communication. If you continually ask the question and don't be still long enough for an answer, you'll never receive the answer. I was dealing with Malachi here the other night. He spent the night. And he was being very inquisitive about these little airplanes that he got. All right? And some of you guys that were at the men's breakfast, you saw the airplanes, right? He, he was being very inquisitive about the airplanes. And he was asking me questions about these aircraft. And he wouldn't be still long enough for me to answer the question he just asked. So finally, I just went, shut up! If you'll listen for a minute, I'll answer the last question you asked. And I wonder if that isn't how God feels with us sometimes. Our prayer life is, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Our prayer life is always, here's my problem, here's my problem, here's my problem. God, I need the answer. God, I need the answer. What would happen if we stopped seeking the answer and started seeking the answer giver? Think about that for a minute. If I continually look for the solution to a problem, what would happen if I stopped looking for the solution and I went to the person that has the solution? And I sat down at their feet and said, teach me. Steve, you remember when you started your first hive? Your first honey bee hive? There was a, there, there's different ways you could do it. You could read all this stuff and try to figure all this out, or you could find Simon and say, hey, Simon, I'm getting ready to start a hive. Teach me something. I'm having this issue because Simon's done it a little bit longer than you have. Okay? Now, if I decide to, which probably not, but if I would decide that I need to start a hive, I now can go to Steve and say, Steve, you've done this before. Teach me something. Or I can go try to bedazzle him with all my knowledge of bees and start talking and everything else. And sometimes you've got to realize who the expert at the table is. You're not always the expert. Sometimes it's best for you to sit silent and learn. So many times when I go into the presence of God, and when we go into the presence of God, we go in telling God what the answer is. This is God we're talking about. He is the expert at the table. We need to learn in our prayer life to go before God with an open heart seeking for the answer and listening to what he has to say. So in this phase of prayer, where we're at now in prayer, is we've got to learn to call on God. Calling on God. And it's easy when we, when we look at it, we think, all right, call on God, call on God. When, but when you look at the full definition in the Greek and Hebrew, it goes this way. In the Hebrew, or in the Old Testament, the word um, call is to call out or to cry unto. All right, so that is help. That's what the word call in the Old Testament means. The New Testament goes a little bit farther. It means to invoke a person or to call a person by name. So if we go to call upon God, it is help God. You know, it's like when you fell in the backyard, when all them kids are running around your house going, and one of them falls and they just scream, it's like, okay, they're playing. But if they switch and they go, help grandma. Now all of a sudden, your ears are tuned in because somebody called your name. They now have your attention. You know, because believe me, when, 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 when my seven are running around here, there's a lot of screaming going on. There's a lot of noise. There's not much silence. But if somebody yells, help pappy, they now have my attention. We need to learn in our prayer life to call on God, to call him by name, to invoke his attention. Not just make noise. 
Whose help do you need? Remember in, in, in Psalms, what is it, Psalm 91? I'll lift up mine eyes to the hill from whence cometh, is that nominate one? Anyway, look it up. From whence cometh my help? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. That's who I'm calling to. That's who I'm laying hold of. I'm not just saying a prayer. I'm not getting to the end of my prayer and closing by saying, in Jesus' name, amen. I need to learn to get a hold of the throne and get a hold of God. So here in uh, verse 8, it starts, over, uh, starts off this way. It says, all give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him, sing psalms to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who rejoice, let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. Okay, here's a process that we have to go through. Okay, in seeking, that is not drive up and place your order. Okay, it's the same intensity that if you lose something of great value, what you'll do to find it. You got up this morning, you had to come to church, and you couldn't find your car keys. You're going to now go into seek mode, or you're going to go into blame mode. All right? It was like, uh, I'm going to pick on you, Kathy, all right? I went to get into fellowship hall this morning, and I couldn't find my keys to get into fellowship hall. And I started to say, I know where I put my keys. I put my keys in the same place all the time. And I went, Kathy is the last one that had my keys. And I'm like going, I can't get it. Listen, the same intensity that I seek, the same feelings that I felt, I got in, Kathy, don't worry about it. And she hung them on the bulletin board. She hung them where all the other keys are at. That's not where they go. I go, and I get in, and I sit down, and I had to go, calm yourself a minute. There is a solution and an answer. And when I go in, and I'm faced with a situation that, that, that is out of the norm, okay? The norm is my keys are where my keys are always at. That's the norm. My norm was messed up. Now, all of a sudden, I go into this mode, so many times when we hit a situation in our life, our norm gets messed up. We need to go into a seek mode, not a panic mode, not a worry mode, not in anything else, not a, oh, my God, what's going to happen? I don't understand. Oh, no, no, no. And we start to fretting, and we start to worry, and we start to concern, and we start all these things. And here in the Scripture says, listen, call on God. How do you call on God? First, thank him. Tell him how great he is. You know what? He had you in the last situation you were in, and it didn't turn out to be a disaster. His hand guided you through it. Remember it. That's called building yourself up in faith. So when you're in prayer, you can look at God and say, God, you did this. The last time I was going through a situation, you didn't leave me. You didn't forsake me. You walked with me through that situation. And if you did it before, you'll do it again because your word promises me you don't change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And since you're the same, you're a good God. You're a great God. Your mercies are new every day. When I feel like I'm going completely out of my mind and I'm going completely bonkers, I can stand on the rock that is higher than I. I can go back to the foundation of the truth of the, of the matter that Jesus is my rock. That if I call on you, you're faithful to save me. If you read through Psalms, Man, life. David understood what it was to call on God. If you read through there, uh, you, can't, you can't go very many verses where it says, I called on the Lord, and he heard me. I called on God in my distress, and he was there. The difference is I'm calling directly to the answer giver instead of going down all the other paths. It's easy when you're in a situation 
when life is happening, it's easy to call on everybody else. Problem arises, call your mama. Listen, she's as messed up as you are. Call pastor. Don't call pastor. Please don't call pastor. (laughs) We have to learn and mature and grow and, and understand the fact that I have a direct line to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The answer that I need, he has. I just have to tap into it. I have to begin to call on his name. Verse 14, it says, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Remember his covenant forever. The words which he commanded for the thousand generations. The covenant which he made to Abraham. The oath to Isaac. And confirms it to Jacob for the statutes. To Israel for an everlasting covenant. Saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as an allotment for your inheritance. Go back and remember those promises that God gave to you, those promises and the things, and you declare them before everybody. We're so quick to declare our problem and so slow to declare our answer. How acquainted are we with the negative side of things? We can identify very quickly, bad. But are we as quick to see the good? When you walk up to somebody and say, oh, so how was your day? How many times do they line up and say, man, you wouldn't believe the good things that happened to me today. This happened and this happened. God did this and God did. What do we normally do? Oh, man, what a day. Well, it was a day. Boy, this was a tough day. This was, uh, where's our focus? Where do we go? You go where you focus. You get what you focus on. Now, the situations of the day might have been hard, but was the faithfulness of God made real in your life while you were going through it? So why not say like Job did, God, it all belongs to you anyway. Job got to the point where he said, listen, I was naked when I got here. I can leave that way too. It all belongs to you. God, you didn't change. Yeah, today's today's throwing some things at me that are just, whew. But man, God, thank you that you're faithful. Thank you that I'm not losing my mind. Thank you that I'm not losing my salvation. Thank you that I I can turn to you. Thank you that I have everything that I need. I can remember growing up, there was a focus that people were, uh, they really focused on what you say. So the famous and the the favorite saying for everybody, if you'd walk up to them and say, so how are you today? It was, I'm blessed and highly favored. They would continually say it and continually say it and continually say it. Now, some of them was lying through their eye teeth. But some people got a hold of really what they were saying. They weren't saying that everything in my life is perfect. They weren't saying that everything is smooth, that, it, that woo, you know, I get up in the morning and there's a halo. Oh. They weren't talking about any of that. What they were saying is I'm blessed and highly favored. Because the grace of God's new every day. Yeah, what I see is a bit of a mess. But man, look at what I've got on my side. If God's for me, who can be against me? Thousands will rise up against me and not a single one of them can touch me. He's going to prepare me a snack in the presence of my enemies. I'm going to sit down and eat a candy bar while they mess around. They may be saying stuff. They may be coming against me. There may be a battle going against me. And all I got to do is rest. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. I don't know how to get out of this, God. That's okay. Relax. Trust 
Me. Man, that, that's hard for me, Rob. I'm a fixer. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a fixer. I'm, I'm one of those ones that always, I, I can figure it out. I, I, can, I can figure this thing out. But that gets in my way so many times because it limits my time, Steve, and my ability to trust. To really trust, God, you have this. But what I see is a mess. What I see going on and what, is, what I feel in my spirit are two very different things. If I look through my human eyes, we're in trouble. But God says, it'll be all right. Just, just relax for a few minutes. Just, just chill. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 20, Second Timothy 2, verse 20. But in a great house, there's not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. And when I read that the first time, Dan, I was like, I don't understand what he's saying here. But what he's saying in this, in this passage, when I really started to dig it out, is in life, there are things of great value that people look at and see like silver and gold that everybody wants. But then there's those things of clay and dirt that nobody wants. The word puts it this way, it rains on the just and the unjust. Not everything in your life is going to be silver and gold. Not everything in life is going to be that precious vessel. Some of it's going to be earth and clay. You're going to go through some stuff. All right, that's what he's laying out here. But then he says this, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor. He, what he's saying here is as you deal with and go through the stuff that happens and you cleanse yourself, you bring yourself, you learn to rely on God, you learn to trust on God, you will become a vessel of honor. So it's how I deal with the situations that I'm going through is going to be to determine the type of vessel that I am. Can I tell you, in my life, there are things that I've handled correctly. I have. But guess what? There's also things that I have handled incorrectly. Where at the end of it, Nobody was standing and saying, oh, did you see that man of God? Look how he did. Oh, he must really have a great relationship with God. No, I kind of let corrupt communication proceed out of my mouth. Some of that will catch up with you as you're driving home. You'll be going, ha, 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 I got what he said now. I, I, I allowed myself to go somewhere that I shouldn't. I allowed my thoughts to go somewhere that they shouldn't. I got so wrapped up in the situation that I forgot the power of God. I, and that's not bringing honor. At that point, I'm not that vessel that I need to be. It says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master. Prepared for every good work. Wow. In this situation that I'm going through, it's possible for me to become a vessel that God's going to use to clean all this up, to help in this situation. But here's the, here's the process that I have to go through. Verse 22. Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who are called on the Lord, who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. What's he saying here? It's a lot of words, we're going to put it in Dougisms. All right? I like Dougisms. You ready? Grow up. Stop acting a fool. Get past yourself 
the universe doesn't rotate around you. Not everybody is out to get you. The devil's not under every rock looking for you to mess up. You know, the cool thing is the devil is not omnipresent, which means he's not everywhere at all times. That's God. And if the devil's on you, you must have the ball. You must be doing something really important for the devil to take out of his time to come chase you down. What happens is we get these little seeds of doubt. We get these little seeds of thought. We're our own worst enemy so many times because we act immaturely spiritually. Instead of making grown-up decisions spiritually, we move on immaturity. We make childish decisions. We get wrapped up in self. And when I say we, guess who? I'm guilty too. Where, where I don't look at it the way God says, and I'm not following after the things of God, and I'm not going after those things of God with everything I have, with my whole heart, because it says, seek me and I'll be found. Well, I want to go, I don't see it. But I'm not willing to move a chair. I'm not willing to look under the cushions. I'm not willing to tear things apart. I'm just willing to step into the room and say, nope, it's not here. Send Abigail to look for something. She's going to go in like a whirlwind, shh, run around the room, come back, says it's not there, and it's laying on the table right where you said it was. And you go, Abby, go back. It's on the table. She come back, nope, it's not there. How many of the things that we go through has God already given us the answer to and told us where it's at, and we go, nope, it's not there? Why? Because we're not willing to seek it. We might have had to move something on the table to uncover it. It's there. There's even a point in the scripture he says, "You listen, you guys need to seek me while I can be found. You need to press in with everything that you have. How, sure, how are we supposed to seek God? With what? Everything. All your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, everything that you have, you should be seeking after God. I give so, many of my, so much of my energy away to other things. One of the biggest energy zappers that we have is what if? Worry. It's one of the biggest energy zappers we have. Doubt. Can faith and doubt occupy the same space? Well, let's ask this. Can light and darkness occupy the same space? Huh. When I turn on the lights, darkness has to go away. When I turn the lights off, darkness comes back. Can they both be in the same spot? No. It doesn't happen. It's the same way with faith. I get to choose which one. Do I turn the lights on or do I trip over stuff in the dark? You know that thing when you get up in the middle of the night and you kick that thing? You know that coffee table's been there for years, but you still find it with your pinky toe because you wouldn't turn your lights on. I do that in my spiritual life so many times. I know that I have this situation, but I don't turn the lights on. I don't put the word of God to it. I'm not applying the principles of God. He's already given me the answer. I just have to go to the table and get it. I just have to seek after it. I just have to desire it more than anything else. But I put uh, a codependent attitude on. So many times, I'm dependent on having a problem. Have you ever met those kind of people? That if there's not a crisis in their life, they'll create one so that they feel valued? Spiritually, we do that sometimes. We wouldn't know what to do if we were walking under an open heaven and a blessing of God's on your life. You'd be looking around saying, okay, where's the problem coming from? We're always looking that something bad has to happen. I don't think so. God's desire for you is good and not evil according to him, so why am I looking for something bad to happen? I should have an expectation every day that today's going to be a great day. How's it going to be a great day? Because I'm going to make it that way. 
My business emails, that's how what they say. Make it a great day. Don't have one, because guess what? If you're waiting on it to happen, probably not going to. But I can make it that way. How do I make it that way? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he'll take care of the stuff. See how all this stuff ties together? We, we want to pray, leave our prayer closet, and go do what we want to do. So we'll pray about a situation. God, give me wisdom. God, give me guidance. And we walk out, and we forget that we asked. And there's all these road signs, blinking lights, idiot lights going, Doug, walk this way. This is where the answer's at. The error is pointing at it, and I miss it because I'm so wrapped up in the problem instead of walking fully into what he's already given to me. Make adult decisions. But God, you don't understand. That light, that answer is way over there, and I need to go over here. So do me a favor, God. Would you pick that answer up and move it over here so that I don't have to go all the way over there? I'm tired. Mel Joe, the other day, we were looking, and Chris is getting ready to leave the house, and she said, Mel, you need to help me pick up the, the toys before we leave. Oh, I'm tired. Boom, middle of the floor. She was just running around like crazy, but there was a requirement put that says, I need you to do something. And then all of a sudden, it was... <laughs> Guess what we do? God says, son, I need you to do this. We go, oh, dad, go, I'm tired. Can't you just give it to me? Can't you pick them up? I'll sit here and watch you work. I'll sit here and watch you do it. Come on. Do I really have to do that? You know, it's kind of that Naaman moment where, where uh, the, the prophet tells Naaman, go dip in the Jordan seven times and your leprosy will be healed. And he was like, I'm not going to dip in the Jordan River. That's dirty. I'm going to the Euphrates. And his servant had to look at him and say, dude, listen, if he'd have asked you to do something hard, you'd have done it. Go down and fall in the creek, would you? And just dunk yourself seven times. What's it going to hurt? You'll get a little muddy. If you get a little muddy and it doesn't work, then we'll go to the Euphrates you can take a bath. But see, we want to look at God and say, God, I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it this way. I don't want to pick up my toys. I don't want to eat my broccoli. I don't want... I don't want to, if it's green and it's not cooked to where it's brown, it has cheese sauce on it, I want nothing to do with it. But I realize that some of those things are good for me. Some of those things are things I need to do. What do you mean about God? Seek first your kingdom. Why, why I'm trying to build something here, God. I'm trying to make my life comfortable. God turns around and says, no, I need you to build my house. I need you to build what I have, and I'll take care of building yours. But we, we go into prayer then. <laughs> we want to use prayer to try to change God's mind. Think about it. God gave us an answer that we didn't like, so we're going to go back and ask the question a different way so that maybe we can trick him and he'll give us a different answer. Guess what? He's all-knowing. You can't trick him. Had an old pastor friend of mine used to say, your arms are too short to box with God. Give up. Just do what he says to do. You're not going to win this argument. So it's just better that I go and do what God's charged me with. This, and and I'm, what I'm calling him, he says, now, go do this. Okay. Make a grown-up. Avoid huh, foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they just generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. 
That doesn't sound fun to me. You mean I have to be nice? You mean I have to? Yeah. See, when you're a child, everything is about you. And when somebody touches your stuff, there's a war. Get a new toy. Sister comes over and touches it. Oh, my God, they're touching my toys. And what do we try to teach our children to do? Share. Oh, that's a bad word. What do you mean share? But this is mine. This is, this, is, this is mine. Share. What is the concept of sharing is an adult concept. Because once you become a parent, you no longer anywhere in your life have yours. You're sharing everything. Think about it for a minute. After you had kids, after Rob came along, came along there was never anything ever again that was yours. And I had to begin to make grown-up decisions. I still, as a young father, battled the thought of, get out of here, kid, this is my space. So we create man caves and put locks on them and don't let the kids in. What God's saying here is, says, listen, as my child, as this, when you're going into prayer and you're going into these things, I need you to put all of that selfish stuff away and this all has to become about serving God. Now this begins to change how we present our prayers to God. So we have to look back at how Jesus prayed in the garden. Let's break that down just real quickly. Jesus goes to the garden, asks his disciples, pray with me, okay? Just stay here, pray with me. He goes, and he's major league stressed. How do we know he's major league stressed? He's sweating blood, okay? That's stress, okay? You can actually look that up. That is an actual medical condition, Okay? So it's, it's not a metaphor. This happened, okay? He sweat to where the blood vessels in his head began to burst. He was stressed. We like to make these things cute. And we like to King James it and say, Father, if there be any way, take this cup from me. What he was saying is, God, I don't want to do this. This, I don't have it in me. I don't think I can do it. I, I'm so weak. I don't want to do this. Don't make me do this. But then he kicked from being a child to being a man. And he said, but nevertheless, Father, not what I want, but what you want. He went from being a child to being a grown-up. Jesus gave the most selfless act that you could ever give. He laid his life down. He laid his life down. Word of God says, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lays life down for his friends. So it changes the way we enter into prayer. It changes from gimme, 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 gimme to Father, what would you have me do? So maybe there's a life situation that you're in, something that you're going through. And you've been praying and you've been asking and you've been saying, God, I need to, uh, I, I need to have maybe... We should change our prayer and say, Father God, in my situation, what would you have me do? What do you want me 
to do here. Because the word tells us that he knows what we have need of even before we ask. So maybe I should go to him and say, Father, what would you have me do? Because, see, I trust him. So I have to go to my go-to scripture over here in Psalms 91. It says that he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. Surely he's going to deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover me with his feathers and under his wings shall I, shall I take refuge. His truth shall be my shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terrors by night nor the arrows that fly by the day. Nor the pestilence that walk in the darkness. Nor of the destruction that lies waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. You shall give, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands you shall in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lions and upon the cobra. The young lions and the serpents shall be trampled under your feet, because he has set his love upon me. Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call, get this, he shall call upon me and I will answer. Woo. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Man, we got to change how we pray. We got to change how we pray. I've got to learn to call on God because he's my refuge. I've made my dwelling in him. I'm in right standing with him. I'm walking according to his precepts. I'm walking according to his, and in that, I have direct access to everything that I need. So no matter what situation you're going through today, because I'll tell you what, every single one of us has something going on in our life. Every one of us has an area, something there where we need God. So the question comes down to, am I willing and are you willing to take your hands off and allow God? And then am I willing to be obedient to go where he says go? To stay away from where he says stay away from? To do what he says to do? To seek first his kingdom and let him take care of the other stuff? Because you know what? If I could fix it, it would have already been fixed. Because I like my comfort. I'm not going to put myself in an uncomfortable situation. Believe me, if I got a choice between sitting in my lazy boy in a metal chair, you're sitting in the metal chair. I like my comfort. All I have to do is learn to pray according to the will of God. When I call on him, he answers. Didn't say he might, did it? Psalms 91, verse 15. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. 
So he is. The answer is there for the very things that you're calling for, the very things you're praying for, the very things you're asking for. He is answering you right now. Listen. Listen. And then to to the old song that says, trust and obey for there's no other way. To be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. He's got your best interest at heart. Some of you may need altar time. We've talked about the altar, and we've talked about the purpose of the altar. Sometimes there's, there's things that you just can't carry anymore, and you need to lay them at the feet of Jesus. That's what the altar space is for. This isn't up here just to be pretty. This isn't up here just to be a space. If that was the case, we'd put more chairs in it. It's called the altar. And you bring your burdens, those things that have got you befuzzled, that you can't figure out, and you lay them at the feet of Jesus and you leave them there. So as I close in prayer, listen, if you need the altar time, the altar is always open. Right, and we'll say it again so you get it, okay? What, and, and help me, Alex, if I'm missing this, if I'm not making it clear. The altar is always open. That means at any time, whether we're in service, whether if you need to come to the altar, get a key and come in here and come to the altar. Is there anything special? No, it's, it's that place, though, where you can get a hold of God a place that had been sanctified and and set aside for you to meet with God. Because every Sunday, I'd let this go for a while, and I picked it back up this morning, Frank. Because when Frank and I were talking yesterday, I had to ask God to forgive me. Because for years, I always came in, and I always walked the altar, And I walked every row. And I began to pray and say, God, there's going to be a need that sits in this chair. Meet it. And I let that go. And we, we, Frank Frank and I were talking, I looked and I said, man, I got to fix that. I fixed it this morning. Because I can find every excuse. You know, Sunday morning's busy. It's busy morning. No. Never be too busy. So the altar is always open. If if you walk in and people are standing around talking, you need the altar, where do you go? Go to the altar. If we're in the middle of praise and worship and God's dealing with you on something, and you just where do you go? You go, oh, well, people will see me. Well, let me tell you something. If they run their mouths and are talking, then they're breaking what God says. They've got problems in their life. What they should be doing is coming behind you and laying hands on your back saying, God, I don't know what the situation is, but intervene. You pour in the oil and wine, the kind that restores the soul. God, whatever this situation is, and we begin to intercede for one another. That's what family is. If you ever feel embarrassed about coming to the altar, God help us. God help us. It's always, always open. At the end of the service, when I close, I always stay right here. The reason I stay up here, because traditionally I should go to the back door and shake everybody's hands. They go out the door and they say, oh, pastor, what a great sermon you preached. And I say, what did I preach? They have no, I don't know. But it was great. No, the reason I stay here is because the word of God says, if there's any of you sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church and let them anoint you and pray for you so you can be and walk in your healing whether that's a physical, mental, emotional, social, whatever that problem is, we're going to be here to pray for you, to come into agreement with you. But then you have to go home. What happens when you walk out of here? Some of you need to earmark Psalms 91 in your Bible, and you need to read it every day. Because you're walking through stuff. 
And every day I'm going to understand that God is my protector. Every day. No matter what's happening, every day, God's going to protect me. And we're going to see the fulfillment of what God's asking. Seek first the kingdom. Father God, I lift all the needs in this room and those that are watching online and those that will watch this later. I lift these needs to you, Father. Lord, we need your wisdom. We need your guidance. We need your direction. So, Father God, I pray that you would unfold your will to each one of us, that you would give us the boldness to walk in the fullness of what you have for us. Lord, meet us where we are. Lord, forgive us for where we've fallen short, where we've missed the mark. Lord, I commit it all to you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. If you're with us today and you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, man, I, walking through life without Jesus, whew, no thank you. The Word of God is very upfront and says very clearly that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved. It's not a might. It says you will. Man, what a promise. So it's just a simple little prayer. If you've never prayed it before, I'm going to ask you to pray it with me. And it just simply goes like this. Jesus, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe that you died, you were buried, and you rose again so that I could have everlasting life. Come into my life and be Lord of all. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you prayed that with me today, you need to tell me. You need to tell Pastor Frank so that we can get you plugged in, so that we can walk together this walk in the fullness of what he has. Amen? Love you guys. Have a great week. God bless you. Thanks.